Will I confirm your pass code? Your pass confirmed. Please enter your personal identification number or PIN. Follow the pound or hash key. When you hear be the 30 third person to join the meeting, conduct business planning. To I for you are now muted. Market the changes that have been made inside the store. What neighborhood where the store is located? Is that safe, attractive environment for walking? Where are the other businesses surrounding the corner store? Economic de development and redevelopment agencies have resources to help with all of these issues and more. Tools and resources of economic development and redevelopment are the focus of today's webinar. I'm you today from Public Health Law and Policy in Oakland, California. We partner with state and local leaders to improve health in all communities. And we do this by researching legal and policy questions, draft policy language, and training community advocates to put these ideas to work. Now, because I'm with lawyers, I do have a little bit of fine print. The information today is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. And the primary purpose of this webinar is to address policy options to improve public health. There's no intent to reflect a viewpoint on specific legislation. So you know a little bit about me. Uh, let's take a look at who you are. You are joined today by participants from all over the country. In fact, more than 800 people registered for this webinar. A great way to connect with other Healthy Corner Store advocates is the Healthy Corner Stores Network. And I strongly encourage you to sign up for the listserv and newsletter at our website, healthycornerstores.org. Today's webinar is being co-sponsored by the Community Food Security Coalition, one of the partners in the Healthy Corner Store Network, along with the Food Trust and Main Development. I want to review the technical assistance that's available to if you have difficulty at any point during the webinar, please contact Scott Watkins. And the best way to reach him is using WebEx chat, which I will explain in a moment, or email. So during the presentation, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment to all attendees, please use the chat box. Let's take a moment now to warm up the chat box, which you can locate on the right-hand side of your screen. Tell us, enter into the chat box, what is your favorite fruit. I see pomegranates and persimmons. Some pea fruits are popular. And we encourage you to use the chat box at any time during the presentation to ask or respond to questions from the presenters or other attendees. Following the discussion, uh, we answer your questions. Finally, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording after the webinar ends. We'll start the webinar with a podcast that tells the story of how a coalition of advocates in San Francisco no longer muted. agency to bring financial and and technical resources to a small store called SuperSave in Bayview Hunters Point. As you watch the podcast, pay particular attention to how the redevelopment agency brought new resources to the partnership community organizations had already built with the store owner.
call-in user, if you can go ahead and hit star six on your phone so that you can be muted. African-American neighborhood on the southeastern edge of the city. The most low-income residents live close to industrial sites in a neighborhood isolated from the rest of the city by major freeways. On top of that, in the Bayview, as in many low-income areas, it can be difficult to find healthy foods. Which you have the situation where you don't have a real full-service grocery store. You have a lot of liquor stores and bodegas which do not have the kinds of facilities and infrastructure internally to even support the provision of healthy food. Instead of healthy food, there is a proliferation of junk food and liquor. As a result, people in Baby Hunters Point face high rates of obesity, high blood pressure, and diabetes. Residents say they want healthier food, but they have to go to great lengths to get it. Peggy Dunn spends over an hour taking two buses, and BART across the Bay to Oakland to shop for groceries. I'm trying to eat more healthier because I'm getting older. Because I'm a long time. For decades, residents have protested to get good quality, fresh foods into local stores. In 1967, neighbors picketed outside the Super Save grocery store, demanding fresh vegetables and lower prices. And Bay has been involved in more recent protests at Foods Co., a neighborhood store that residents have long accused of selling spoiled foods. We wanted fresh fruits and vegetables that were just that fresh. We wanted less white on the shelves. We wanted more wheat bread. We want organic milk, you know, things that were healthy for our people. This community's efforts, those things aren't readily available. San Francisco Redevelopment Agency is working to change this. For many the agency has tried to convince developers to build a grocery store in the Bay Field. But groceries have offered a range of explanations about why they can't locate there, says so development agency head Fred Blackwell. Argument is that communities like Bayview Hunters Point can't support a full-service grocery store, that the issues are a deterrent to full-service grocery stores, that the footprint that full-service grocery stores need to be successful aren't available in neighborhoods like the Baby Hunters Point. We heard all those arguments. In order to lure a grocer, Blackwell and his staff had to take on those concerns one by one. He hired a market analysis firm to show that residents spent millions of dollars outside the neighborhood that would otherwise go to local businesses. It also used crime data to show that the neighborhood was safer than many thought it was. I think the data story started to create a different view of the market. Finally, the city negotiated a lease with Fresh and Easy, a large multinational chain of supermarkets. Where the fuck my man? Well, stocked store will be in a new building right on 3rd Street in the heart of the neighborhood. Above will be affordable family senior housing. In the meantime, the health department and community groups convinced the redevelopment agency to invest in the small stores that are already doing business in the baby. The AG is now working with stores like SuperSafe. Sam Allowdy is the owner. Well, I bought the store in 1998. Uh, it was a liquor store, I mean, typical liquor store. But slowly, Allowdy has been changing that, cutting down on liquor, adding prepared foods, and bringing in a wide variety of fresh produce. Broccoli, spinach, celery, cabbage, lettuce. I mean, sales have increased. But Allowdy still struggles to change perceptions of his store and to attract new customers. He's applied financial assistance from the redevelopment agency 
to, to change the store's layout. The plan is to uh, move all the produce to the front right here. Our plan to move this, uh, I mean, the check stands, then to have all this area, about 25% of the total footage of the store, to make a, a, a this display. Many development agencies offer programs to improve store exteriors, but it's unusual for redevelopment to fund changes to store infrastructure and to work so closely with store owners to increase healthy food offerings. Fred Blackwell. Efforts that we have made just to improve Super Save is really working closely with the store owner there who's been fabulous to go and visit other places where there are uh, stores with a similar kind of footprint, a similar kind of niche, who've been able to make healthy food access a priority. In other cities, redevelopment agencies have used similarly innovative strategies. They've helped establish and promote farmer's markets in cities like Davis, Ceres, and Temecula. In San Diego, the redevelopment agency has invested in an urban farm. Other agencies have played important roles in attracting full-service grocery stores to underserved neighborhoods. Improved access to healthy food is one way these agencies can work with communities, local business owners, and other government agencies to improve health. Part of what's needed, says Blackwell, is a broader culture shift within redevelopment. Less to our own devices as real estate folks. We'll get the deal done. But we keep ourselves around the table with uh, folks from the Human Services Agency and the Public Health Department and the School District and the Community Development Department, uh, as well as to stay connected and grounded to residents and business owners in the neighborhood, I think we'll end up with a better product, a more arduous process, but a better product. Collaborating with the Health Department showed San Francisco's redevelopment agency the importance of bringing healthier food to Bayview Hunters Point. With focus on improving health, the redevelopment agency is doing what it does best, working with businesses and developers to revitalize the community. Planning for Healthy Places, I'm Robert Ogilvy. Other podcasts in this series and more information on redevelopment and public health, please visit www.healthyplanning.org. Again, a part of Super Safe story that's not covered in the podcast is what happened before the development agency got engaged. There was a ter terrific amount of groundwork done by a coalition of advocates together with the San Francisco Health Department, um, collectively called CIFA, to build the relationship with a store owner and involve the community and youth in making positive changes in the store's transformation. And the coalition had been working with the store for many years uh, before they were able to convince the redevelopment agency to take on such a meaningful role. For those of you in California, uh, you may have questions about what's going on politically with redevelopment. We're going to cover that on the webinar today, but um, please look at the chat box uh, for some uh, up breaking updates on what's happening. Let's take a moment to learn more about the tools of economic development and redevelopment, and specifically uh, what they can do for healthy corner store work. We had to be joined by Robert Ogilvy on the webinar today, but he had a pre-existing commitment, so you're going to be listening to a recorded presentation. For those of you who don't know him, Robert directs PHLP's Planning for Healthy Places program. Uh, he has an extensive background in working in community and development and planning in low-income neighborhoods. Prior to joining PHLP, he was a faculty member at the University of California at Berkeley. And he'll be talking about how the tools and resources of economic development can be applied to healthy corner store work. Sorry to interrupt. It sounds like we have technical problems and the sound is not going through from these presentations. Okay. Um, which gears then? Uh, Scott, can I have the presentation ball, please? Sorry, I had to use my cell phone for a webinar, so that's... Yeah, I know. I could see it. I just... Okay. Well, yeah, you do. Well, Rob will not be giving the presentation. I will be giving the presentation. Um, so we're going to um, look at how the tools of economic development and redevelopment can be applied to healthy corner stores.
Okay. So thank you for bearing with us through technical difficulties. The goal of healthy corner store work is corner stores that are economically self-sufficient, selling healthy, affordable, fresh food. I think that we can agree to that general goal, even though we're all doing that in slightly different ways. And there are two potential partners for that work, uh, economic development agencies and redevelopment agencies. Economic development agencies exist to promote uh, economic growth in, a, in their um, service area. And do this um, in a variety of ways um, through funding and technical assistance and other resources. Redevelopment agencies uh, exist to also to improve economic growth, but with a secondary focus on improving physical conditions in specific blight areas. Both agencies um, have access to uh, tools and resources, but neither has played a big role in stimulating healthy food retail. The economic development and redevelopment agencies have business development expertise, including business planning, accounting and financial plan planning, planning assistance, and merchandising. And these tools are really a helpful, a helpful complement to the uh, work that healthy store advocates do. Planning for the shift to a new business model, um, get accounting systems and financial planning systems in place uh, to shift the business model, marketing assistance to get the out to the community that this store is doing something different than what the community has previously expected, and to make sure that the fruits and vegetables and other perishable items are displayed um, properly, is are displayed properly. I apologize, we're still having some te technical difficulties here. Thank you for bearing with us tools that economic development and redevelopment agencies have include uh, facade improvement and to upgrade store exteriors. Uh, some of you might be familiar with mainstream programs, Main Street programs or facade improvement programs uh, through the Community Development Block Grant Program. They also have access to low-cost loans for small businesses who may have di difficulty accessing traditional sources of funding. Economic development agencies and redevelopment agencies have also provided support for store owners w wishing to upgrade their equipment. Um, as we know, refrigeration is a very critical, a very critical component of uh, corner store work. And uh, programs that support uh, investments in energy efficiency, um, since energy costs are often very, very high for corner store owners, and, and encouraging more efficiency in the area um, can allow them to take more risks in, their, um, in merchandising. So how do you use your case to attract new partners? First, because of potential motivators. Economic development agencies and redevelopment agencies are motivated by uh, economic return. Um, they're motivated by the overall impact on the, on the well-being of the community. So they may be different than uh, those factors that, that may motivate you in your work. Um, you may be more interested in health outcomes for individuals. But economic development and redevelopment agencies are going to be looking at the impact for communities. So at uh, the, we can use the data that um, that you may have about how to make a healthy community. Data can be very, very effective. Really uh, play to your strengths, what you're good at. No one here needs to become an economic development practitioner in order to be an effective partner. So you're, you're very good at education, at outreach, at marketing. That can be a, a very important partnership. But when I was interviewing Sam Ali, who um, heard from in the presentation, he spoke glowingly about an outreach event that the community organizations had put on at his store um, that had happened some three or four years earlier. He still uh, felt that that was bringing positive effects to his store. So a quick overview of the tools of economic development and redevelopment and how they may play into your work. We're now uh, and be joined by two advocates, 
uh, from LA and, um, and one from Philadelphia, uh, who are economic development and redevelopment practitioners um, who will share a little bit from their perspective about how they've partnered with Healthy Corner Store advocates in their community. Uh, the format for this portion of the call will be dialogue, and we want you to join in. So, um, first we're going to hear from Cedar Landsman and Claire Fox. Uh, they're program coordinators of the Community Market Conversions Program in South LA, California. This program is the result of a partnership between the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Los Angeles, the County Department of Public Health, the California Endowment, and Los Angeles Neighborhood Initiative. This year, the Redevelopment Agency will be partnering with corner stores to implement a pilot program to refurbish four stores. And I think what is so exciting about this program is that the Public Health Department will be working right alongside the Redevelopment Agency uh, with support from uh, CPPW, for those of you who are familiar with that program, to community outreach and education, a marketing, a youth development program, and policy change efforts to encourage future corner stores to carry fresh produce and, produce and healthy food. I'd like to uh, invite Claire to um, sh tell us a little bit about the program and um, how it came to be, how this partnership came to be. Claire, unmute your phone. And now, hello? Uh oh. Hello? We can, now, you're now speaking. Oh, okay. You can hear me now. Great. Okay. Well, thank you um, uh, for that introduction, Hannah. And I'm going to quickly go over what the Community Market Conversion Program is and then. So you talk a little bit about why we're doing our work in South LA. So the Community Market Conversion Program is a program of the Community Redevelopment Agency of Los Angeles um, and is available citywide. But over the next year, we'll be looking at a four-store pilot project in South Los Angeles to be completed by summer of 2012. So what the program essentially is, it is a commercial rehabilitation loan program. Uh, store owners through the development agency are offered offered a conditional loan of up to $25,000 for to update their exterior facade as well as interior construction that does also include the purchase of a refrigeration unit. This is a conditional loan, meaning that it's for or deemed repaid after 10 years if the store owner complies with the program requirements, which is essentially to sell healthy foods. And I'll say more about that in a minute. There's also a grant for architectural and engineering services and technical assistance for up to two years. And, and the technical assistance, as we heard in the podcast, is really important to help store owners figure out what it means for them to work with perishable goods, um, how to develop relationships with new suppliers, et cetera. And then the TAA provider will also support stores in implementing EBT and WIC access in the store so that this good, healthy food is, is broadly accessible to the community. So it's very similar to a regular commercial rehab program, except for those additional components. And one of the major conditions of the program is that the store owners must allocate a certain percentage of their floor space to fresh produce. And that percentage will be mutually determined between uh, the store owner and the TA provider and CRA staff. It will be financially and logistically viable for the store owner. But once they determine what that percentage will be, that's sort of locked in as a condition of their grant. Um, for the pilot project for the year ahead, it, it, we're partner, partnering with a foundation called the Calvin Endowment, as well as a local nonprofit here called the LA Neighborhood Initiative. And through that, that, the local community will be engaged through community-driven planning and design to oversee the selection, design, and construction of the stores, as well as marketing, outreach, and education activities to really build the customer base and generate demand for healthy products, and also be a youth component, as you mentioned, Hannah. Um, so how did the CRA get involved in this? Well, as I discussed already, CRA LA, you know, had already been involved in a number of uh, food access-related stores, mostly uh, supermarket-anchored multi-use projects. Um, they also spearheaded the Market Opportunities Program, which is a program to 
package and market all of the city's incentives to uh, the grocery industry to help them site in underserved communities. So when staff at the CRA learned about some small scale corner store projects that were happening that the California Endowment was involved in, they said, well, you know, we could use our commercial rehab loan and do a full-scale physical remodel as a part of this conversion. So they started to talk about partnering because, of course, CRA understood that they could do the capital improvements, but they couldn't community engagement and public health aspects, which we all know are also very important. Um, and so the conversation sort of went along until an opportunity for funding came up through our Department of Public Health. They have a project called RU which is uh, by communities putting prevention to work, and really catalyzed the partnership at that point. The CR really outreached to the endowment, which re-inspired them to continue with the nurse store work, and then they recruited Los Angeles Neighborhood Initiatives, which <clears throat> excuse, is an organization that has expertise in community-led planning and development projects and had already worked with the CRA. And then they also, we also contracted with a TA provider for the pilot program, hired two part-time project coordinators, which is myself and Peter. And then Peter's going to talk a little bit about um, the context of South LA. So you need to unmute yourself in order to be able to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Hi. So a little bit about why South Los Angeles. Um, and I think that the podcast actually did a good setup uh, in terms of the community uh, food environment conditions um, that, you know, were present in Bayview Hunters Point. Uh, similar conditions exist in South LA. So um, the residents and community groups in South LA have long been organizing around the lack of option access to healthy food and service grocery markets, as well as the overabundance of liquor and convenience stores in the area, and the connection between this and serious um, nutrition-related disease problems in the community. Um, so out of that sort of community desire to address this issue, um, the conditions are really backed up by a lot of statistics found through various studies, and the conditions really correlate with poverty. Um, the area South LA, which had the highest rate of poverty in LA County, also had the highest, highest rate of obesity among adults and children, heart disease um, related deaths, incidence of diabetes, all higher than the county average. Um, additional studies also have shown that South LA uh, has the lowest rates of adults and children consuming recommended servings of fruits and vegetables, and also high rates of um, consumption of fast food. All of this has also um, been in the context of um, sort of inadequate access to full-service grocery stores, and um, there's been surveys on the quality of produce available in the stores that are there. Um, residents in the part of in this part of the city have reported, you know, that that quality of food in the stores, existing stores, is, is not good. Um, it is what this looks like. That um, there's often expired food that people suspect comes from markets in other uh, more affluent parts of the city um, that didn't get sold. So all this is, you know, discourages healthy consumption. This is all in the context of a history of what we could call neglect of South LA uh, by the grocery industry with urbanization and white flight, you know, throughout the, the you know, between the 60s and the 80s, supermarkets looking for both, um, you know, cheaper lunch easier entitlements and also driven by uh, is you know believed to be racist or classist or you know perceptions inner city communities of color have sort of systemically you know disinvested from South LA in the area with a you know a lack of adequate grocery services. So just to put in context, the area is home to over one point three million people and has sixty full service grocery stores, um which is about half proportionally to the number of residents as other more affluent parts of the city. So there are markets, but they're inadequate. And this also leads to uh, not only inadequate uh, consumption of fresh food, but also serious retail leakage. People, you know, as we know, people have to drive further, spend more money to go outside of their neighborhood to get um, groceries. And a study in 2008 showed that, uh, you know, about $113 million in retail leakage. 
There's also a serious over con uh, you know, concentration of uh, corner markets. South LA has twice as many corner markets as the average, and um, they say 94% of the total retail food environment in South LA is these smaller format stores, but they typically don't carry fresh food. So that's why um, the drop really now to focus on not just big supermarket to attracting supermarkets, but really working with these small corner stores um, to become sites of healthy food access. Thanks, that's a very helpful context. I have lots of more lots more questions for you, but we're going to um, <laughs> shift gears and introduce Andy Toy um, from Philadelphia. Andy is currently campaigning for an at-large seat uh, for Philadelphia City Council, so we're very happy that he was able to carve out time to join us today. Uh, he has a really interesting background. He most recently worked at the Enterprise Center in Philadelphia um, directing their retail resource network, and he'll be describing that work today. Um, but he comes from uh, a more, I would guess, a, I would conventional, not to say that he's what he's been doing hasn't been interesting, but economic development is, as it is typically practiced. Um, he uh, worked at the local initiative support corporation, which some of you may know as LISC, uh, in economic development and real, real estate development. And he also worked in the Philadelphia Department of Commerce uh, for 15 years, where he specialized in business real estate transactions um, for businesses throughout the city. So, Andy, um, thank you so much for being here today. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about the food retail environment in Philadelphia for those who aren't familiar with it, and then tell us more um, about how the Enterprise Center got involved in working with small food retailers. Sure, thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. No. Okay. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Food Trust, the Reinvestment Fund, and uh, Dwight Evans for really being um, leaders in Philadelphia of this effort. Uh, um, if it weren't for one of the presenters, Dwight Evans, uh, actually, who helped to fund a lot of the work, uh, we probably wouldn't be talking about this right now. Uh, so, um, describing the food retail environment in Philadelphia, I think, um, is maybe a little different from LA, but, but there's, there are all similarities. It's, it's a very densely populated uh, city. Our neighborhoods are um, really very close knit. And uh, which is great in many ways because uh, uh, you can actually operate businesses and have a population within walking distance or close by. Um, for uh, because of the small footprints, uh, it's very hard to find places for larger markets, larger uh, scale markets. And uh, the other issue is a lot of people don't have cars to access to go further away. Uh, okay, in my book, but. Um, the so the the need for corner markets is actually real, um, uh, but as a, I think many people have acknowledged, uh, many of them don't carry fresh foods. Um, and uh, the interesting thing that just happened uh, that we just saw some news about one of the major uh, what's considered decent supermarket just just closed in Germantown in Philadelphia, and they're going to open up a. Uh, sort of a lower end retail uh, market there, which uh, is kind of unfortunate. I'm not sure <laughs> all the details behind that, but that kind of shows that even the supermarket level, it's it's a competitive, very it's a it's a, it's a difficult environment in many time, in many in many ways. Even though we do acknowledge that there are many uh, places in Philadelphia that just don't have enough um, access to fresh food and uh, larger formats, uh, we call them food deserts. Um, as far as the corner groceries, uh, what I have found is many of them actually rely on uh, those kinds of things that are not great for community. Uh, lottery tickets are really a big thing, um, cigarettes, and sodas, chips, and those kind of uh, products that, that are the usual fare. Um, and even the sodas, for example, it, it's, it's easier for some um, corner groceries to carry sodas because the companies that that are promoting those uh, drinks are uh, will supply them with a refrigeration or some other equipment to to uh, carry those, and also the advertising that, that comes along with that. Um, as you probably have seen cigarette um, advertisements all over the front windows of some of these stores, which is a problem. Um, so the Enterprise Center got involved in this 
the Enterprise Center is, is a place in Philadelphia that has uh, that promotes minority entrepreneurship uh, in, in, in general in the region, but um, I was working in the retail side, and in particular uh, neighborhood commercial corridors or neighborhood retail. What, what I found is uh, are the needs uh, of people out there is, are the same needs for basically many different retail businesses, even more so for food businesses, is access to capital um, and the technical assistance that often people don't, um, uh, they don't have that vision or they don't have the time to deal with uh, things like marketing or, or basic accounting systems. Um, design is really important. Um, using a website for some businesses, uh, having to deal with the health department and the various licensing issues, zoning, and, uh, and as well merchandising, which I think we, we've come to realize is fairly important in terms of making sure people know what you have in your store and how, uh, how you're marketing or displaying the, those materials, the, the uh, products. Um, we also, I believe that food, and we found that this is, is a big uniter in communities, and it's sort of how we got into it was that realizing that um, pretty much the places where people eat or, or go to shop uh, for food are, are places where um, where people come together, and they're and they're critical to the, uh, the commercial corridor or the community because many other types of businesses like shoe repairs and um, uh, clothing stores have, have sort of migrated to malls and other places or, or generally disappeared, uh, but food is always a, a need, so it's going to be there, and it's going to be something that we really need to promote in, in neighborhoods. Um, the other thing we did at the Enterprise Center in, in getting into this, um, into this work was, uh, aside from the places that we were already working, mainly in West Philadelphia, uh, but across the city, were um, the food truck asked us to help them out at one point with uh, some of the um, uh, a, a, a business of corner store that actually was a, a bodega that that, provide, uh, that was making salads for other corner stores, and that was kind of an interesting experience, where um, one of the um, one of the entrepreneurs was basically taking fruits and uh, uh, adding value to it by by creating salads, fruit salads, and and transporting them to other stores. Very difficult, though, because, uh, as you can imagine, if they sell, there was a question of who was responsible for the cost of that. Um, and uh, there's a shelf life issue there. Um, and then the transportation and, and the cutting of the fruit. Uh, it's very complicated, although he was doing it for a while. I believe that he had stopped since. Um, it's an example of the difficulty of... of um, the environment, and um, but the opportunity that's there, if we can figure out how to make it work, um, that there are value-added products as well. Uh, I guess I should stop there. Say that, that's uh, really interesting, and that's actually one of the questions that I wanted to ask um, Senior. For your work, uh, what are the outcomes, both in terms of economic development and public health, um, that you're looking at to indicate success in terms of the goals that you've set for your project. I understand that you're at the early stages, but how are you uh, how are you imagining that you'll uh, measure the success of your project? Um, yeah, well, you know, as I'm saying, you know, an RU is a successful program would have both positive economic and public health outcomes as well as positive outcomes for the community. These are often intertwined, um, but just to look at them, you know, separately, in terms of public health, increased consumption of fruits and vegetables and other healthful foods obviously is one um, major goal and will be an, an indicator of success we'll hopefully be able to measure, particularly among youth. That's why we're targeting stores uh, patronized by children or you know, within close proximity to schools. Also increased community awareness about nutrition. Achieve this through um, you know, doing extensive outreach, nutrition education, and hopefully some cookie demo demos and ownership and investment in their, you know, in the community food environment in the area, uh, that might be, you know, difficult to have more qualitative uh, indicators, but that is definitely an indicator of success as far as we're concerned. Um, access not only to fresh foods, but also the freshest, 
locally procured foods, this is something we really want to achieve and looking into ways to potentially source from farmers um, markets um, and also working with a local urban farming and gardening organization that has already reached out to corner stores and wants to start um, distributing their produce, which they produce locally in South LA in these corner stores. Um, and then, of course, ultimately, a major indicator of success would be a decrease in rates of, you know, diet-related chronic disease, <laughs> um, and that's something we'll have to figure out how to measure over the long term. Economic indicators, profitability in the stores is obviously a big one, and we really put resources uh, and a lot of thought into this program to, to ensure that that is an outcome that we achieve with the technical assistance um, and the conditions of the loan. Um, you know, I'd like to set an example and really demonstrate that there really is a market for healthy food in South LA, and you know that this would that that would increase further investment both by corner store owners and other healthy food retailers. Um, this all leading to you know catalyzing other community economic development, food and non-food related. Uh, you know, now. That that there will be a beautiful renovated store, four beautiful renovated stores in these areas. We really hope that that will be catalytic for bro uh, broader community revitalization. Um, the economic outcome we'd like to see is really the fostering of a local food economy, building relationships between local producers, distributors, and retailers, these stores, um, you know, and contributing to the growth of new economic networks networks that really do give back to the community and sort of reverse this process of, um, you know, serious retail leakage and food dollars leaving the community and economic opportunity for local residents. And ultimately, by improving food access and community health, we really hope to see the lessening of the spin on residents and, um, you know, contribute to their economic stability by both reducing the cost of accessing food in terms of transportation and time. Um, you might be ways we could, you know, do serves around that over time. Um, and also reduce the cost of being and or living with chronic disease. Ultimately, that is the, um, that's the public health outcome and that's the economic factor related to the public health outcome that we want to see. Um, because, you know, these chronic disease related to Adequate nutrition is a major um, economic drain on residents in the community. So those are some of the indicators we're looking at, but we're, we really are in the early stages and still developing precise measurement tools and processes for how we're going to gauge success, but hopefully that gives you an idea. Yeah. That's great. It's a really ambitious and admirable set of goals that you've set for the project. I'm curious to hear from, from Andy, since um, you, you're a little bit further along in your work, what did you find that were the biggest barriers for store owners uh, who want to make a shift in their business model towards towards health choices? And specifically, uh, I'm curious um, as they tried to access financial um, ca capital for their projects, what were the what were the obstacles that they encountered? Um, I think first of all, when you're a small minor, um, well, small entrepreneur, many minority entrepreneurs um, are really not aware. Of of what's out there, and, and they're really, they've got their nose down on the ground level, and they're really just trying to make it day to day, so it's really hard for them to, to be able to look around and figure out what is available out there, and what resources are available, and um, they can do to improve their business by sort of looking a little oddly. Uh, so the knowledge of the system that's out there is, is um, really a bear. Um, and uh, places like the Enterprise Center, and there are a number of other uh, organizations in Philadelphia, um, and even the government uh, are important um, resources for people to be able to identify, and, but often it's hard for them to know where to go. Um, a little of a, of a real barrier was um, when we were working with the Food Trust and the, the RF, the Reinvestment Fund, um, to uh, provide some funding for refrigeration equipment and some other equipment for West Philly Produce, which was the one business that I, I worked with in West Philadelphia, they didn't, he had a real problem with his account, actually, had not um, updated his, uh, his accounting work for a year and uh, needed to clear up some issues um, in order for them to feel comfortable um, that he was a, a, a viable business. Um, because certainly lending or, or 
or granting monies to a business that's going to go out of business in a few months just, just doesn't make sense. It has to be a good investment. Uh, so we were able actually to help him another program to find an accountant that um, we paid for a portion of, the, of that cost and found a local accountant um, who didn't charge um, real high prices and just got his books in order. And, and that, was a, that enabled him to get his foot in the door in order to get um, access to a small grant to help him buy um, equipment. Um, that was really important because that's very different from the supermarkets that are trying to open. They have a much uh, more sophisticated uh, understanding of what's going on out there and how, how they have to access capital. It's a very difficult task, alas, but uh, even for the small person who may not have uh, a good credit history or, or other issues that kind of tie them, tie them up in terms of that cap access, that's, that is a real issue. The other thing I would just say is uh, that, that ties up some folks that are trying to convert towards fresher foods. Um, and I'm not sure if this happens everywhere in the country, but in Philadelphia, you need um, health department um, certification or what's called serve safe certification. You have to go through some training and some classes, and you have to have all your proper equipment in place. Um, um, and, and for West Otis, actually, you had to, um, because he was all doing some value-added work, which is taking the fruit and making smoothies out of them, uh, out of it, uh, and doing some other things. Uh, he has he had to go through a major process with the health department, which slowed down quite a bit. Um, had to have a three bowl sink, and um, you know, basically have inspections and make sure to make sure that uh, his place was safe and clean. Um, and then, five would say. Uh, um, the, the for a small business like that in the neighborhood that's used to going to the corner store and buying um, chips and soda and candy and that kind of thing uh, is that you've also got to uh, make sure that people um, their budgets have to change a little bit and they have to be they have to understand that th this is a really good thing um, they need to support their their local store and um, it's been a it's been a slow but steady process for him in that sense. And he's, he's from the neighborhood, and he's and he's leafleted and flyered, and he has his young people working in the store from the neighborhood, his children as well. And it's still um, a struggle. And, and, and his, his, his products are always look really great. Um, so I think it's not a question of having um, produce or anything like that. It's just getting people into the store and realizing that they can, um, this is something they can buy, but they, they have to do something with it and either eat or cut it up or cook it or whatever. So that's, uh, I, I think that that's the real, the, the, the slide and the demand are, are both um, important. I think that um, it's really interesting to hear you talk about the different um, kinds of uh, additional expertise that store owners need to make this successful transition. Um, you talked about accounting. I think it's probably fair to say that many or most stores could probably use assistance getting their books in here. I often um, sort of the analogy that corner store owners are a bit like farm families. They, they uh, you know, they're working so hard, they often have jobs outside of the store to keep their, their families afloat. And often the accounting systems aren't there. So as you said, that's a real barrier when they want to access lo conventional loans um, to support their business. And it's, a, and it's a barrier for business planning. If they don't actually know where their profit centers are, it's hard to make the shift uh, to a different business model. The other area of expertise we saw in the podcast is really around learning how to merchandise produce. Uh, the owner in the, in the podcast um, was trained as an architect before, before he moved um, to the Bay Area and happened to come into the corner store business because that's what his family did and that was a way to have a livelihood in a new country. Um, so the redevelopment agency was able to engage an, an expert from the produce industry to teach him how to not only how to um, manage and keep the produce fresh, but how to display it in a way that was compelling um, for shoppers to um, to begin to, to buy the food. And that there's a bit of an art to that, um, so that support was very useful for him. Um, I wanted to ask a question of Claire. Um, you mentioned um, it was mentioned in your introduction that 
there was a lot of work underway um, in Los Angeles at the time that the Redevelopment Agency got involved in Healthy Corner Store work. What advice would you have for people on the call? Uh, what do Healthy Corner advocates need to know about the field of economic development in order to be effective uh, a part of them and to um, capture the attention of their uh, redevelopment or economic development agencies locally? Yeah, I, I you can try it. Okay. Yes, I can. Uh, I think what we've touched on is really valuable um, towards that end. I think this question of understanding healthy core conversions from the point of view of the store owner as a business owner is something that we need to keep revisiting. I don't think there's enough documentation out there of, of why this makes good business sense for store owners. And that's come up for us in the last couple of weeks. We have community that and staff going out and talking to store owners, and they're really excited to hear from the community and from their customers, but they really want to talk to other store owners who have gone through this process and um, really, you know, understand how it pencils out for them, how risky of an endeavor is this. And it's just, you know, on the research that we've done, and even, you know, a lot of the store conversions that were taking place before in Los Angeles were pretty small scale, you know. It, it amounted to sort of popping up a few baskets, racks of, of fruits and vegetables, and some great community outreach and um, not all sort of community activities, getting people really excited about the prospects. But when you, when you talk to the business owners, it's not, it's just not clear, it's still unclear for them what it means for them in terms of their business. And so I think that's something that we came out healthy corner stores in terms of economic development, we really need to see it from their point of view and and how it makes sense for them. And, and, and as you were talking about, mobilizing that data and sharing it with each other. Because I think that really, really the eyes of redevelopment agencies once they, you know, sort of understand how it fits into their broader mission. Um, and then, you know, from the point of view of a redevelopment agency, too, I think it's useful to know that sort of projects are not very expensive from, you know, they're not, um, Money from the point of view of a redevelopment agency. But we had one store conversion. This is actually prior to community market conversions um, was created, and they're doing a sort of normal commercial rehab program. It's a forty-one thousand dollar project. That's really small for a redevelopment agency. So that sounds like a lot. I think in the world of you know profit agencies, for example, where you know I come from that world too, and you're always just struggling for money, but. I think that that's just something to keep in mind. So, for example, for the community market conversions program, you may not, the store owners may not need the full seventy-five thousand um, dollars that's allocated for the facade have, but um, but that is there, and it means that you can spread out resources more. And there's also a number of foundations that, whose focus is large-scale capital projects, or you know, building, helping to fund community centers and charter schools. So why not engage them about funding 10 store conversions, right? And, and you know, that's their focus is those capital projects. And then partnering with them, you know, the value add of partnering is that you bring the, the, the community efforts, you bring the, the public health, nutrition, education, et cetera. That's something a redevelopment agency cannot do. And then I would just say, you know, the broader picture is thinking about how do these store conversions not just improve health, but build financial, social, and cultural capital, which we've talked a little bit about today, and I think that happens through improves to the built environment, to the food retail environment, but it also can happen through um, building community infrastructure that's presented as leadership in health and nutrition and business, and, and those are things that really matter to redevelopment agencies as well. As, as you said, what's the overall community impact, and, and how is um, store conversion can do to a community wealth building process overall. Thank you. I have a question from the audience for Andy. Um, how to deal with affordability um, given the increasing cost of food and the um, community in which you were working? Um, how did you make the, the fresh food affordable or what a barrier um, in your work? Um, how did the entrepreneur make it available, uh, uh, affordable? I think the, the the, of what we were just talking about in terms of um, making it affordable, uh, we had to bring down the cost of uh, his business, and, and that was uh, the refrigeration and unit, um, some of the really big items that, that we were able to help with uh, through, through the partnership. Without that, I, I'm not sure if he would be in business today, actually. And, um, in this particular case, um, we had an entrepreneur who was just really pursuing his dream 
of, of providing something really great for his community. Um, and uh, he also is supplementing, as you were saying, he's also supplementing his income there by, uh, he's a contractor as well on the side. He actually built this building, hit the building on a blood vacant lot. And uh, um, so it is really tough. Um, but I think it's a supply and demand question, or a pricing question. You can't, if you, if you charge too much, you're not going to be able to sell those products, but they charge enough to, in order to make some pro profit. And I'm not actually sure how he prices his, how to size on the price of his uh, product. Um, but this, as, as the product gets to a certain age, he's trying to figure out, out to turn it into something else. He may freeze it, which is um, that uh, he can use it later in a, in a smoothie, actually. Um, so that's kind of the, the way he's dealing with it. There is a big risk in fresh food because it, it will add. And um, that's why a lot of these corner stores, all you see are onions and potatoes. They're, they're like the things that might last a long time, but um, that's not, you know, that our only definition of fresh, I guess. It's a real the parability factor really intersects with affordability and volume becomes very important there, I would imagine. I want to mention another um, strategy in addition to, to um, bringing the overall operating costs down that Andy touched on, which is to, is working to make sure that the um, stores you partner with are set up to, um, or authorized to accept both WIC and EBT, um, the SNAP program. That, that I think is a real um, key ingredient in, um, in improving accessibility of the of the food, um, received a couple of questions um, for care dealing with with local food. Um, what's your What's your perspective um, for folks that are starting out who are interested in local food? Is it your would your recommendation to to start directly with local food or um, start with fresh food and bring bring local in um, as you, you go? Well, that's a good question. Um, in Los Angeles, we're, we're sort of blessed because there is some local urban farming and, and community gardening organizations who have been in the corner stores already on their own for many years in terms of developing distribution models um, for aggregating yields from these small they call mini farms in South LA um, to be able to meet the, the volume needs of the store owners. And we're, you know, so that's sort of already been percolating. It's not something that community market conversions is, is working on, but we're really excited about that prospect because it, we do want to source locally as much as possible, and we recognize that's important, and we want to, you know, support the development of a of a local food infrastructure. Um, and so we're we're hoping, right, that that, that by by partnering with local organizations in that way and supporting their social enterprise in terms of distribution on scale, um, that that might bring costs down. I would say if that doesn't already exist and exist in a community and it hasn't been fully developed and tested, that the core of affordability is, is very real, and EBT and WIC can get us so far, but if it's going to be more cost effective, these are just, you know, these are considerations for a local community, right? What, what, what makes the most sense? But if it's going to be most cost effective for customers, um, that you're sourcing from your your produce terminal market, um, then that might be the first way to go. And then you know, talk to local community organizations that are doing community gardening or urban farming, et cetera, and figure out what you know what it might look like to to store like that. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we've received a, a bunch of really fantastic questions um, that we unfortunately don't have time to answer on the webinar. I wanted to let everyone know that uh, in addition to the recorded transcript of the webinar day, I know that many of you had technical issues um, with audio. We will also be emailing a written summary, um, and we will address the questions in the written summary that we weren't able to cover on the call today. So, in closing, I know that, that those of you who are on the call have many, many, many ideas and questions about how to increase healthy choices at corner stores in your community. And I think there's a temptation uh, to jump right in to making the changes inside the store. I think it's critical to think about building the capacity of the store owner to carry on the work after you've gone. And uh, Cedar and Claire and Andy, thank you so much for sharing some of your thoughts about how you how you work with store owners so that they can 
continue the work um, after our funding streams run out, um, you know, after the attention shifts to, to other work. So my advice to those of you on the call, before you jump in the water or if you're, even if you're already in the swimming pool, take a moment to step back and identify your partners in local government or community organizations who have the kind of expertise in economic development that we've talked about, who know about accounting, um, who are familiar with, with produce merchandising, um, who can help the store owners access capital um, for the upgrades. And if you need help figuring out who, who those people are in your community or how to convince economic development and redevelopment practitioners to care about healthy food retail, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us at Public Health Law and Policy. Uh, we're really here, here to help. If you're interested in continuing the conversation, um, with your peers who are doing healthy corner store work, uh, healthy corner store work. Again, I really encourage you to sign up for listserv at healthycornerstores.org. So that includes our webinar. Uh, a big thank you to Cedar, Claire, and Andy for joining us, and we will see you at our next webinar. Thanks. Thank you.